please welcome to the stage Trent Monday. I don't need to tell you why. I mean, he's a nice guy, but <laughs> just not my thing. <clears throat> wellness is a movement, not an industry. This spa and wellness industry that we all talk about, it's really just a bunch of like-minded people sitting in a room like this, singing Kumbaya and going on our own personal journeys of enlightenment and self-discovery. And spa people in general are a bunch of overpaid, underworked prima donnas. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Trent Monday, and today I'll be playing the role of devil's advocate because these are the kind of conversations that I have with hotel owners and general managers all around the world for a number of years now. That is actually the perception of a lot of the hotel partners that we deal with. And therefore, of course, it is their reality. And I think it's important when we come to events like this that we are surrounding ourselves with like-minded people, and that's great. <laughs> to the people in this room, spa and wellness is just about the most important thing there is. But if you take a walk across the road here to Tesco at lunchtime and talk to the people there and see where spa and wellness ranks in terms of their priorities, we'll probably get a very different answer. And that's okay. Again, we're like-minded people in the room. That's great. If we were doing vacuum cleaners, it would be the same conversation. Yay, vacuum cleaners. People at Tesco don't care. But I think it's important when we go on these conversations about spa and wellness is everything for everybody, that we keep the perspective in mind about our market that's around us, our customers, and our hotel partners. Because my theory is, and it's been this way for a while, I actually reckon the hotel spa business is a little bit broken. I actually think we're at the point now where we need to seriously evolve, if not have a revolution about what we offer in the hotel spas. I believe that it's time for us, you know, we talk about when, when we need to re reassess something or reevaluate something, you know, we talk about looking at ourselves in the mirror. Take a long, hard look at yourself in the mirror. Mum used to say, go and have a look at yourself in the mirror, at least she did to me. Um, but the problem with looking in the mirror is when we don't like what we see, we're really good at just changing the angle a little bit and say, oh, shit, my bum doesn't look that big after all. I've got more hair than I thought I did. So I actually think we've got to spend more time looking out the window rather than looking in the mirrors because once we start looking at what's around in other industries, then we get a better idea of maybe which tack we could take. Why do I say that the hotel spa business is broken? Well, we're not catching as many wildebeest as we used to. Capture rates is one of those metrics that we all live and die by in hotels. And a corporate city hotel, probably 1%, up to maybe 3% of the guests in the hotel are using the spa. If you're really, really good, you'll get 5%. In a, in a resort hotel, maybe 7 to 12 to 15%. And in what I call a remote location, somewhere like, say, the Maldives, where you're stuck on an island and you can't get off, the best capture rate I've ever seen was 33% capture rate. And when you talk to people outside our business and you talk to them about those numbers, they're kind of staggered and they think, no, it's, it's more than that, it has to be. But it's kind of not. So let's flip that for a little bit and say anywhere between 67% remote island resort and 99% of the guests in our hotel don't really care that we exist. At least they don't care enough to come on down to the spa and spend some time and spend some money. And so I think what we need to think about is if we've got a business where we're catering to only 60 odd percent of the clientele in the hotel, the whole reason we're in a hotel spa is because it's a captive audience in the hotel. But if 60% of them or more, 99% of them are not coming, then all of a sudden we're the ones captive because then you've got to get people to cross the threshold. Occupancy is a funny thing because in hotels, they live and die by occupancy. In spas, we almost never talk about the occupancy of our spa. And I think the main reason for that, and just to put it in perspective, my, I guess my perspective is more of an international one. It's not specific to the UK, but it's also not specific to Asia because I, I look after essentially everything outside of the US for my company. And so I've got, I guess, a fairly international perspective in terms of four-star, five-star hotels. I don't know too many hotel GMs that would still have a job if they had a 30% occupancy. Yet, when we look at our hotel spas, 
in terms of the availability that we actually have, in terms of rooms and beds, 30% is not unusual. We've also hit the ceiling in terms of how much we can charge for a treatment. I remember when I started with Mandara Spa back in 2005, this time of year at budget time, it was all about how much are we going to increase our prices. Not if, but how much. And it had nothing to do with the cost increases, nothing to do with the cost of labour or anything else. It was just purely to do with how much the market would sustain. And I think the best year we had, we increased prices like 13% for, the, for one year. These days, the conversation is very different. This time, budget, budget time, this type of year, we're talking about how do we, we create value add, how to create, create packages, how do we lower the costs. So we've hit the ceiling in terms of how much I think we can charge for what we offer. And as a result of that, as all of these costs keep going up and our, we've hit the ceiling in terms of a price point, our costs keep going up, our margins keep shrinking, and that's where all the profits end up. And so it's becoming a really, really tough, really competitive business, which everyone in this room knows. And the challenge is if we continue to do what we're doing now, we'll continue to see a bit of a downward trend on those business metrics that we talk about. And this is the most dangerous conversation that I've ever had with a spa director. Because they say, yeah, but if, if only the general manager would let me put more collateral in the room. If only the general manager would spend more money on marketing. If only the guests knew where we were, because we're in a horrible location down in the basement or up on the third floor next to the swimming pool. If only is probably one of the most dangerous things you can have your spa directors saying, because it's basically absolving any responsibility for what's there. The reality is that when you look at at the breakfast restaurant. Everybody finds the breakfast restaurant every morning. Doesn't matter where you put it, they'll find it. And why is that? Well, because we all need breakfast. Spas are a want, not a need when it comes to the hotel. And I think we need to think about, are we gonna shift that and become more of a need? My favorite question to ask at these sort of events is the glass. Half full or half empty, right? Bill Cosby once said, before he got thrown in jail for being a disgusting, perverted individual, <laughs> he said that it depends on whether you're drinking or pouring. And actually, I think that's a really intelligent thing to say. I think it's, it's all about your perspective. Because if you're drinking that glass, it's half gone, I need some more. If you're pouring, then of course you need to top it up. You need to, to get more in, it's half empty. So, show of hands if I can, who believes that this glass is half full. Who believes it's half empty? There's not many people who like it being empty. Because the positive side is to say it's half full. And we're spa people, we're positive people, despite what I'm putting forward to, to you this morning. But to me, it's always half empty, unsurprisingly, I guess. But that's because we can't do anything about what's already in the glass, that's already done. We always look back on what's done and say, we've done a great job. To me, it's what's not in the glass that we can impact. And so we can impact the stuff that's not there. In the empty lies the opportunities. We can determine what goes in there, when it goes in, how fast it goes in. And so I think we need to think more about our glasses being half empty and focus on that. Focus on the 60% of the guests that aren't coming to your remote resort location. Focus on the 90% of the guests in your city hotels that aren't coming down. Because again, if we're captive, sorry, if we're in the, the hotel and we've got a captive audience but they're not coming, then we're the captives because we've got to get them to cross that threshold again. So that's all the good news. And I actually think it is good news because the people in this room are the sort of people that can change this. If we recognize that the business is at a bit of a point of flux, maybe, a bit of a point of transition, then the people in this room can actually change it. And the great thing about it also is that it's not different. The funny thing about spa people is we keep saying to other industries, yes, but you don't understand because spa is very unique, it's very different. But it's kind of not that different in a lot of ways. Industries generally are the same. They all pretty much follow this curve. They create, they grow, they mature, they decline. And it's at that point of decline where you need to either innovate and go back up or you just go away and die and you become Kodak or you become Nokia if you miss the next wave, if you decide to continue doing what you're still doing. And again, 
that's kind of part of my message is that I think we need to seriously think about what we're doing and decide which curve do we want to be on now. Because I believe we're at this point, we're at that, that X, where we need to either innovate and go on a different, different track, or we just, just drift down there and die away. Interesting sub point is that 1995 was really the start of the commercial internet. It's kind of the time, or the consumer internet. The time of the public ISPs, the time of the private ISPs closing down, the time of Windows 95. It's also the time that Mandara Spa started, 1995. And it's always fun to me to talk to hotel GMs that are, that are in their 30s, because they don't remember a time when hotels didn't have a spa. <laughs> to them, they think, well, spas have always been in a hotel. But the great thing about being a bit older and being around a bit longer is you remember the time when we didn't have spas. I still remember doing a business plan for a hotel in Perth back in, I guess it was 93, something like 93. And in the SWOT analysis, the number one strength for our hotel was that we had a gym. And it wasn't even a gym, it was one of those crappy little universal stations, you know, the little multi-station things that were there 20 years ago. It was a horrible experience as a gym, but no one else had one. So it was our, it was our strength. But nobody was talking about spas. Today, of course, everyone's talking about spas. And spas became the USP for a lot of hotels. A lot of hotels jumped on the bandwagon because they said, well, we need a unique selling proposition too. We need something to stand out. The problem is, of course, when everybody's got one, it ain't so unique anymore. So, what do we do? <coughs> Everybody wants to know the answer. I don't know. I'm good at asking questions. I'm not so good at coming up with answers. So that's kind of up to you guys to think about. But one of the things that we're jumping on is this idea of wellness. Everybody's on the wellness wagon these days. Spas are going to go to wellness. Every spa needs to do wellness. And I remember probably about 10 years ago now, I was having dinner with a guy who some of you will know, Professor Jerry Bodecker, who was the chair of the Mental Wellness Initiative, one of these super smart professory type guys, right? I like hanging out with smart guys because through osmosis, I become smarter. That's my theory. And during the dinner at his place with a bunch of people, and he sort of had this throwaway comment, he said that, that spas can be the organizational face of wellness. And I kind of thought, what the hell was he talking about? Dinner went on. I saw him three or four weeks later. I said, what the hell were you talking about? What do you mean by the organizational face of wellness? And what he was talking about is that we can be the place that guides people onto a wellness journey. Because wellness is a thing that people are becoming more aware of, and they don't know how to navigate the space. So spas could be the way that we help them navigate the space. And that's kind of where we are today, right? A lot of hotels, I was at the Global Wellness Summit a few weeks ago, and it's all about wellness. It's the Global Wellness Summit. But it used to be the Global Spa Summit. If you look at the timeline now of the Global Wellness Summit, the word spa doesn't appear anywhere in the timeline. But for the first, for those that have been around for a bit longer, for the first, I think, three or four years, it was actually the Global Spa Summit. They've now decided it's all wellness and that's all there is. And these days, when you go to industry conferences, it's all about, we all need to do wellness. And I'm okay with wellness, but I don't think that's the only answer. Because if you really think about it in a hotel context, wellness is not something that we go down to the spa to get you two hours of wellness, right? It's not like a massage. Wellness is something, as we all know, you've got to live and breathe every day, right? It's in what you eat, it's in how you move, it's how you sleep, it's everything. So in the hotel context, it's the entire hotel. If you want to be about wellness, it's the entire hotel. It's the food and beverage department, it's the restaurants, it's the housekeeping department, the linens, the chemicals that they use. It's the engineering and the lights and the air con and the materials. So take yourself forward maybe 10 years, I don't know, maybe 12, into a world where people at hotel school now have a module on wellness. Doesn't matter what you're studying, if you're a hotel food and beverage course, at a, at a fed food and beverage course, you're learning about wellness. Same with engineering, they've all got their wellness module. So if we really believe that wellness is the way forward and hotel spas are all about wellness, then that's what's gonna happen, obviously, right? The, the education arms will jump on it and they'll educate everybody on wellness. So it's not totally inconceivable that in 
I don't know, 10 years, 12 years, the restaurant manager could know more about wellness than your spa manager. Right now, we think we're the only ones that know about wellness and we have to lead the charge. But again, not so far in the future, I think, we're going to see the rest of the hotel learning about wellness. The assistant chief engineer is now an expert in wellness because he's done the Delos Well Building Standards and he knows so much about wellness. Is your spa still the place for wellness? Is that still our, our point of difference? Is that still our value prop to the hotels? Because that's what we're looking for now. We're looking for the value proposition. We're looking for what value we bring to the hotel. And again, if we've got 60 to 90% of people not coming, we need a better value prop. I think if we really want to talk about being the face of wellness, wellness in hotels, let's think about something more than just giving people advice on meditation or sleep or those kind of things. You know the bubble, the, the global wellness um, economy bubbles, they've got their 10 bubbles that show you the different sectors of the economy. Wellness tourism is a big one. Wellness real estate is a big one. How about when people need a wellness holiday, they come to us for advice. And we don't just give them advice, we actually book the holiday. Now we've got the revenue stream of actually being the source of information, we're actually getting the commission on the booking. Wellness real estate, everybody's trying to get into wellness real estate because they've proven that you get like 20% premiums on the, on the land if you have a wellness component to it. So again, we could be the person that sells the wellness. So I'm not saying we don't want to be the face of wellness. What I'm saying is I'm not sure that that's the only way and I'm not sure for a lot of hotels that it even is the right way. I don't think everybody that stays in this particular hotel right now really cares a lot about wellness. Well, right now is wrong because everybody here is at the conference. But next week, I'm not sure they're going to care so much. So why are we going to shove wellness down their throat? I want to talk about the Blue Ocean strategy just for a little bit, just to give you some ideas about what we could do other than wellness. Does everybody know the Blue Ocean strategy? Has everybody heard of it? Yes? No? Has anybody read it? One, two, three, a few. I always thought this Blue Ocean strategy was kind of all about, um, <laughs> it's all about, you know, it's a blue ocean, it's a big blue sky, there's plenty of fish in the sea, so I don't need to read it. It's just saying there's a lot of opportunities. Until I read it and I realized it's really all about red oceans. Because the red oceans are really where all the competition is, where we're all competing for the same food. And so the, the waters are bloody because we're all trying to eat the same stuff and we need to get to a blue ocean where the market is basically untouched, where we can get whatever we want. And spas are in red ocean land right now because every hotel has got a spa because the GMs tell us they need them. I have some fun conversations with GMs when they tell me, my hotel needs a spa. I said, really? Said, yes. Can you help us? Yes. Why do you need a spa? Because my guests want one. Really? Have you seen the numbers that we just spoke about before, that 1%, 60%? Yeah, but just this morning, I had a guest in the lobby who was complaining because his wife wanted a spa and we don't have a spa. That's one. Give me 30 of those people for another three months and all of a sudden now we have a demand. Now we can start talking. You're asking the wrong question, do your guests want a spa? Of course they do. They also want 75 channels on the cable TV. And then they'll go straight to their room and watch YouTube. They also want to see a gym and a pool, but again, most people don't use them. The question is not, do you want a spa? The question is, would you stay in my hotel if I did not have a spa? It's hard to imagine I'm still in business, really, isn't it, the fact that I ask these questions? But they always come back to me. And if you don't believe me, then shut your spa down for three months. Just, just say it's under renovation for three months and see what impact that has on your occupancy of the hotel. Most people we know, they're not in the hotel for the spa. We're a want, not a need, all of these things. So we need to think about giving people something of more value. Wellness could be part of the answer, but it's not going to be the answer for all of you. This one's a bit full on, so we'll try and step through it a bit. I'll get out of the way. They talk about these strategic profiles, and this is the strategic profile for the circus industry in the US. If you can see it clearly, I know it's not super clear. Um, the black line at the top, the black squares, that represents Ringling Brothers Circus, right, the market leader. Under that, there's a blue curve, which is the smaller regional type of circuses. And the white line, which is fairly dynamically different, is Cirque du Soleil. 
Everybody knows what Cirque du Soleil is? And so if you look at it, what you do down the bottom is you list all of your, the key elements or the key attributes of your industry, then you sort of rank them high to low, and what you do then if you're Cirque du Soleil is you've got to think about what you want to eliminate, reduce, raise, or create to create a blue ocean, to do something differently. So we'll step through a few of them. Right down here in the bottom corner, we've got price, the black box price. For circuses, the price was always fairly low. It wasn't a big deal. Next, we've got star performers, animal shows, concessions, aisle concessions, like the popcorn stuff. They were all a big part of what they do, a big part of their revenue stream. And then we've got a few others here, multiple show arenas. Right down the bottom there, we've got unique venue, because there was nothing really unique about the circus venue. They were all the same. They were tents in the middle of paddocks, muddy or dusty, depending on the weather. And the blue line follows the same curve. It's pretty much the same thing. So the circus industry was pretty much that. So what Cirque du Soleil did said is our first white dot over here on your left is we want to put something that's got a really high price point. And what we're going to do is eliminate a whole bunch of these other really expensive things like the star performers, you know, like the, the ringmaster, the lion tamer, the, the clown. We're going to eliminate the animal shows. They're expensive. We're going to stop these aisle concessions, the popcorn stuff. We're going to reduce a couple of elements of fun and humor. We've still got a bit, but not too much. And we're going to raise the idea of a unique venue. Cirque du Soleil is going to be in these gorgeous venues. And we're going to do something different. We're going to add some theme and some music to it. So all of a sudden, in that white curve, we've got a totally different business from what the industry norm is. And in that space, in that gap, is kind of where they find that blue ocean. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to succeed, but what they did is they identified the existing circus business is that. It ain't amazing. It ain't working. It's not going to change. It's a red ocean. We want to do a blue ocean. We went over there. So what would this look like for the spa industry. This could be a bit of fun. Just a real simple couple of things. Down the bottom, we've got our attributes. So what I've said is we've got facilities and features, design and ambiance, branded skincare. These are all elements of our existing spa business. The blue line represents the current state of the industry, in my opinion. The white line represents the, the spa 2.0, if you like, the, the next version, possibly. Um, price is obviously a big thing for us. Then we've got in-house marketing. We do a fair bit of that because we try and get people from the room into the spa and we don't do a great deal of outside business. Although, of course, for a lot of city hotels, that's becoming an increasingly important part of our business. So what about if we dropped all of those things down? What about if we eliminated this idea of facilities and features and design and ambiance? We got rid of all the branded skincare. A lot of people out there that probably won't be happy about this conversation. But just imagine we did. Imagine instead of having branded skincare, we just had generic brands. Who knows? The price, we dropped the price way down. Instead of in-house marketing, we focused on getting people from outside the hotel. And just to do something a little different, we added a few new things on the end, and we decided to do like a robot massage or a haptic clothing. You know what haptic clothing is? All of the, um, the electric cables in your clothing, and it sort of pulsates and heats your body. And there's going to be a time when this haptic clothing, and I've had this conversation with a few people, for a lot of people that go for a spa to have a massage and relax, haptic clothing is going to take care of a lot of their problems in the very near future, in my opinion, because the technology is already there. It doesn't replace the human touch, I'm not saying it will, but if you've got a stiff neck or if you've got a, a bit of a muscle problem, haptic clothing is, I think, in the f fairly near future, going to solve those problems. So anyway, now all of a sudden we've got two particular white light, two particular curves. One is completely different to the other. I'm not saying that if we did all of those things, our business is going to survive. What I'm saying is the current blue curve is where everybody is. That's the, the red ocean that we're in right now. And I think if we looked at identifying things that we could do differently, the curve would look very different. If you think about that white curve, think about those first few, facilities, design, branded skincare price. It's kind of like that massage at home stuff. What do you got here? I think Urban now is right. It's called Urban. Urban's the one. Urban. Yeah. Yeah. That's the home delivery thing, right? Oh, the home delivery, the home service. They've kind of eliminated the idea of features, facilities. They've eliminated the idea of design. They've eliminated the idea of branded skincare. They've dropped the price right down. Yes, they've also come to you. That was one of the things that they created. 
they've actually created their own blue ocean by taking spa out of the spa and bringing it to you. So that worked. Another good thing in the, um, the blue ocean strategy is this idea of non-customers. And the basic principle is if you identify people who are your non-customers and can find commonalities in the people who are your non-customers, then it stands to reason if you can provide something that actually keeps these people interested, you've now got a new market. And in the Blue Ocean Strategy, they talk about three basic tiers of non-customers. The first are the soon-to-be non-customers. These are the people that are your customers today, but they would leave in a heartbeat if there was a better alternative. And I think that's a substantial amount of the people in our spas today in a hotel environment that aren't specifically going for a treatment. The people that come to this hotel aren't coming here for a massage. They're coming here for business. They're coming here for another reason. And they'll come down and have a massage. They'll come and have a treatment if it's there. So they're your existing customers. But if there was something better to do with their time or if there was a better massage or a wellness offering on, on offer, then they would potentially go there. The next tier is a little further out. These are your refusing non-customers. These are the people that know all about what you're doing. They know exactly what's happening in the spa. They decide they're not going for whatever reason. Maybe it's price. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's value. Interesting side note. Actually, I just thought about it. Um, we asked people in Bali, talk, going back to the, the wrong question and asking the right question, we asked people at some of our resorts in Bali why they're not coming to the spa. We literally walked out around the resort and said, have you been to the spa? Yes. Here's 20% come back again tomorrow, great. Did you go to the spa? No. Why? And what do you think was the number one reason, this is resorts in Bali, what do you think was the number one reason people said, I'm not going to the spa? Anyone want to take a guess? Price. Price? Didn't know where it was? Didn't, know where it was? Didn't think about it? Didn't know it was there. Time. I don't have time. These are Europeans in Bali on a three-week bloody holiday, for crying out loud. And they don't have time? So, of course, you have to dig a bit deeper. It wasn't really about time. It was about value. They had the time. I said, what are you, what are you doing if you're not going to the spa? They said, well, you know, I'm just hanging out on the beach. I'm getting a suntan. I'm hanging out at the pool. So it wasn't really about time. It was about value. We need to find a way to give people value. So these non-customers are the people that I think represent it was funny to me that a number of people actually said just now that it was about they don't know where the spa is. Because I reckon everybody in any four-star, five-star hotel knows that there's a spa. And if they want it, they will find it. Back to the earlier point, right? People say they don't know where to find me. They'll find you if they want to. Give them a compelling reason to find you, they will come. If you build it, they will come. We've been through that era as well. <laughs> and those days are gone. Um, and the next tier I don't think even applies to us. It's the unexplored non-customers, those people that don't know it exists, those people that don't know that a hotel has a spa. I think everybody these days expects it. The industry expects it. And that, to me, is the great opportunity because we are already built into the system. We're embedded in this whole hotel hospitality thing now. 25 years ago, we didn't exist. Now, they need us, or at least they think they need us. Why? Well, they need us for a five-star rating, for example. They need us to get in the travel agent brochures, not so much of that anymore, but even the OTAs to get listed. They need that spa in there. So they need us. That's the great news. But they're not going to just keep us with no questions anymore. They've started asking a lot more questions, right? In the early days, when I first started and came over from the dark side of hotels into the spa side, I could pretty much tell people anything. I could walk up to a hotel GM and say, you need a spa, and this is how much it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you a few million bucks. How much am I going to make? A lot. And that was it. It was done. Because everybody had a spa. Everybody was getting a spa. They knew they had to get one to keep up. Then, of course, everybody got one, and all of a sudden, it's a lot more competitive. The days of the spa being a USP are well and truly gone based on what we're doing right now because we continue to do, by and large, the same thing. We're at a point, I was telling someone last night, has anyone heard the expression, nobody got fired for buying IBM? Anybody heard that? A few people. Back in the days when computers started coming online and people used to talk about going to sell computers, they had the IBM was the gold standard. It was the boring old box, the big blue. 
And then Apple Mac came along and had their funky new machines. But when these Apple Mac guys went to try and sell it, the reluctance they got from industry was, well, don't know. I mean, if I buy IBM, I'm safe. But it's a crap machine. It's not going to work. Yeah, but it's IBM, so it's OK. If they put in the Apple Mac and it didn't work, these guys were lunatics. What the hell are they doing trying to put in an Apple Mac? It doesn't work. It's crazy. It's some newfangled thing. Does anyone hear a similarity between that and hotel spas? Because I do. When I talk to hotel GMs, they tell me we want something new and exciting. I said, right. I said, so here's a few things we can do. They say, well, yeah, but no hotel GM is going to get fired for putting in a spa pretty much the same as most of the spas that we see every day. A nicer version, a lesser version, doesn't matter. Nobody's getting fired if he puts in that because that's the IBM. That's the best practices. But if he does something crazy like some like brings in a robot massage or, or drops the price down or gets rid of branded skincare or some of these crazy things, he's a nutcase. And a lot of GMs are living on two-year contracts, they're living on GOP bonuses, so they're not going to rock the boat. But I think we as the industry, if we're smart and if we're honest and if we look in the mirror and look out the window, we realise that there's a few things that aren't quite gelling right. We're not quite optimising. And it's funny, I had a, a chat with the president of Steiner. Most people probably know who Steiner is. Steiner is the company that owns Mandara. We've now we've been public, then we've delisted. Now we've gone public under One Spa World, which is a new company. But I was talking to the CEO of Steiner, the president of Steiner, a few years ago, and I said, look, Leonard, the problem is we're selling shit people don't want. And he looked at me and he said, I disagree. I said, okay, so how do you explain all of the metrics that are not just in my business, but in all of the business in, in all of our company? He said, well, the problem is our offering isn't quite compelling enough. And I thought, hang on a minute. I just said we're selling stuff people don't want. He said... Our offering isn't quite compelling. Isn't that the same thing? And I realised that's actually the difference between a public company CEO and a schmuck like me, because he actually spun it into a way that the shareholders would accept and the share price wouldn't go through the toilet. If I was on that earnings call, share price would have gone to hell. So I think what we need to do is start exploring the opportunities of doing something different. And the best way I reckon to do it is this stuff. I try to ask people, what would a spa look like if 25 years ago, when we didn't have spas, right, what would you put in place of a spa? You just imagine that spa didn't even exist. And that's really hard to do because, of course, it's, a, it's around us every day. But what would a spa look like, a slightly easy way of thinking about it, what would a spa look like if it was designed from scratch by Nike? What would a spa look like if it was designed by Snapchat? What would a spa look like if it was designed by Samsung? Pick any big name, any big brand, any big product or service. What would it look like if we weren't doing it? Because unfortunately, we're stuck in our... We're in it, right? We're living it. We're the like-minded people. We're the people that we see looking back at the mirror. Because when we go out here, everybody says we're awesome, we're amazing. Yay, us. But when we look out the window and we see what Samsung are doing, which is a little bit different... And I reckon pop-ups is the way to go. It blows my mind that we don't have pop-ups in spas and spa takeovers all the time. Even in a room, it doesn't have to be the whole spa. And there's so many different brands we can do this with. It doesn't need to be spa brands. It doesn't need to be wellness brands. It could be clothing brands. It could be, um, I don't know, vacuum cleaner brands. It could be anything. What would a spa look like if Dyson designed it from scratch? I think pop-ups are a massive opportunity in spas that's being missed. I think you can do it without upsetting your existing customers. You can do it without spending any money because you go and find a partner that you can partner with and they'll bring in all the products and services. And the spa of tomorrow, to me, is 20% of what the spa is today. The manicure, the pedicure, the massage, the facial, all that stuff. I believe that's the 20% of tomorrow. 80% is going to be completely different. And when I say different... I don't just mean different from resort to city, I actually mean different from this hotel to that hotel. Because I've got different guests than you've got in my hotel, so they want different things. In some hotels, it might be kind of like a WeWork thing, kind of like a corporate you know, business lounge meets airport spa with express services meets food and beverage. 
In some, it might be a more of a holistic educational learning thing. In resorts, it might be this whole wellness hub where people go to learn about food and nutrition and culture and all those things. But of course, that kind of freaks people out because they say, well, that's not spa anymore. I say, well, who said? Who said 25 years ago this is what a spa was going to have? It's 25 years. That's all it is. We've just decided what's in a spa. So I think if we can take ourselves out of our own headspace, look out the window a little bit more, we might maybe see there's some interesting opportunities out there. So really that's all I wanted to do today. I just wanted to sort of plant a few seeds, get you thinking maybe a little bit differently, hopefully. Um, there's a bunch of, like my friend here in the front row, I have a podcast, but I decided I couldn't compete with him because he was too good. Adam Chatterley's got a great podcast. If you're not onto it, then get onto it. Um, so I decided I was going to do it every day. So for the last 711 days, 712 is today, consecutive days I've been doing my little daily podcast and on LinkedIn and video and all sorts of stuff. Uh, there's also a couple of little ebooks there that are all free. The website's there. You can contact me if you want to. Um, I don't know how we're going for time. We're late. We're whatever. If we're out. We're out. So there's no questions, which is good. But I am around for the day, so if anybody wants to pop up and say good day, then please do so. And I wish you a very good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much.